Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can I feel that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, and welcome to Barn Blog. And today's episode is in conjunction with Strange Matters magazine. And today we are with Elizabeth Sandifer, author of Neo Reaction, a Basculus, and the article Retroshock over at Strange Matters, which will be in the show notes. It's already there. So if you want to look at it while we're talking, you can. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Uh, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I have been, you know, uh, uh, both as someone who left the paleo conservative right 20 years ago um, and who... 20, 18 years ago, somewhere in there, a um, long time ago, um, and who uh, is kind of become a scholar of what one conservative color is called uh, right-wing uh, criticisms of the American right, a.k.a. reactionary rightist or non-conservative rightist. Um, I've been familiar with your work for a while. Um, so I was when I saw you publishing over there at Strange Matters, I was like, oh, we need to talk. Um and here I am. And here you are. Uh, so you wrote a um, you wrote a triple review of, for for Strange Matters about this seeming reemergence of the cy- of cyberpunk um, media. Um, yes. And what I find interesting about that is cyberpunk. When you read the original seventies and eighties genre dystopian genre fiction and then you know the early um role-playing works it is interesting how much it gets right about the future but it's also interesting what it doesn't include um why do you think it has seemingly made a comeback in the last four or five years i think part of it is that the things that got right are much more important than the things that got wrong um Especially when you look at it in the history of science fiction, you know, for the first really couple decades of science fiction really existing as like a marketed and sold genre, uh, the big bet was on outer space. Mm. And that bet didn't pay off. Outer space turned out to be much harder than science fiction wanted it to be, bordering on possibly on maybe impossible. Like, it's tough to tell, but space travel isn't really going anywhere. Um, whereas the thing that science fiction missed for several decades was this computer thing that was evolving quietly in the background. And cyberpunk had the advantage of being the first genre to get that right. And then also successfully, especially in like William Gibson and, um, a lot of those other earlier writers like, uh, John Shirley or, uh, Bruce Sterling, figuring out a lot about what the awful corporate world was going to look like. Uh, It was cynical in the right ways because it was coming up in the eighties and was, you know, broadly leftist liberal in its perspective. So even if, even if you just in 1983, 1984 allied yourself vocally against Reagan and Reaganism, you were going to have a pretty good prediction of how everything was going to go wrong. Um, and so cyberpunk was right in a lot of ways. And I, the ways in which it was wrong are mostly smaller ones. Sure, virtual reality isn't as interesting as we had hoped. Um, but the broad strokes 
are such that like I mean, even William Gibson in uh, the early 21st century, uh, his tri- uh, Blue Ant trilogy is him still writing cyberpunk, but just writing it about the world that was outside his window. They're contemporary set thrillers with no fantastical elements other than the fact that they vividly feel like science fiction still. Um, and so, you know, you can do cyberpunk very easily about the present day. And I think that's kind of unique in science fiction science fiction doesn't hadn't usually gotten it right and arguably and i think i would mostly make this argument getting it right isn't the point of science fiction most of the time Mm -hmm. so why do you think it's been i mean it's it's interesting how there are things that i think it almost subconsciously picks up on as a critique of reagan's america like there's there is a a profound awareness of how far some of these neoliberalizing of these old Keynesian and Ford's institutions may actually go. Um, yeah. There's also, in ways that, it, that, that are very astute, um, realizes that it's not so much that government completely pulls out of the market. It's not truly laissez-faire. It's that government and the market essentially become the same thing. Um, yeah. Which, you know, there are precursors to that. I think of Widley Scott's Alien, which is pretty seemingly onto that too, in the malaise of the seventies. But um, yeah, I mean, the seventies is littered with proto cyberpunk. Right. It, exactly. I mean, you can cut. If they had called the computer technology better, Alien would be almost cyberpunk in in the way that it feels and deals with characters. And there's a bunch of stuff in early cyberpunk that is closer to uh, Alien. There's a really interesting book uh, to look at if you ever want to get the sort of roads not traveled of, of uh, cyberpunk, Bruce Sterling's novel Schismatrix uh, is this weird post-human future outer space novel that does not look like cyberpunk anymore. Uh, almost everything it did, it did all of the things that didn't really make it in cyberpunk, but it was absolutely one of the seminal, like, up there with Neuromancer in the 1980s as major cyberpunk texts. And then it just wasn't cyberpunk anymore. Cyberpunk kind of went off in a very different direction. And so, you know, there is this weird early cyberpunk movement where it hasn't, where what cyberpunk was going to be was still up in the air and being, and being contested. So this brings me to Cyberpunk uh, 2077 and um, why it seems more relevant now than, say, um, something like... I always think of, if you'd asked me 20 years ago what was the Cyberpunk role-playing game that would still be around, I would have probably told you Shadowgate. Um, But it's interesting how much cyberpunk 2077 doesn't even feel like you're role-playing in the future Um, right (laughs) and i mean the first version was i think cyberpunk 2013 so there Mm. you you weren't originally (laughs) right Uh, or at least you aren't anymore Mm. um yeah it i think part of it is that uh shadow run was we're going deep in the weeds of uh, esoteric cyberpunk here, and I'll get out of them as soon as possible. Shadowrun was written by D&D people. It had, like, orcs and um, fantasy creatures in the middle of its cyberpunk. Whereas Mike Mike Pondsmith doing um, the original, like, cyberpunk role-playing game was much more looking at that first wave of cyberpunk, looking at Gibson, looking at... um, Mm -hmm. uh, Sterling looking at uh, John Shirley and kind of distilling them down into their purest essence, which is what role playing games, um, which was a very, a very modern take on role playing games. You know, if you look at a lot of the contemporary indie role playing game series, it's very much about I'm going to look at a genre and I'm going to figure out a way to distill down how to tell an interesting story in this genre in a very streamlined communal way. Um, And Pond Smith got there pretty, was ahead of his time with uh, Cyberpunk. You know, it's not a modern game in terms of how the rules work or anything, but it is a very modern game in that um, it is based on looking at a genre and, you know, distilling it down and asking what are the core vibes of this genre. 
Um, and so it, it aged unusually well because of that, I think. You know, th this gets me to something, though, that I've always thought about uh, since I engaged with Mark Fisher 10 years ago. Um, is there was a critique coming out of the left um, in lieu of Marx's book, Capitalist Realism, that a lot of this literature was effectively capitalist realist, that even though it aimed to critique through dystopian literature the trends of the 80s and 90s, um, that it also reifies the whole no escape, no possibility. And and you, you, you push back on that a little bit. Um, and I also want to point out, that's not something Mark actually said about cyberpunk. This is a deduced criticism. Right. But um, what, what do you think is, you know, why don't we see more, like one, I guess there's two, there's two questions. Is, is dystopian literature concessionary to the, the, the capitalist trends of the current, even in its critique of them? Is that a valid way to look at it? I'm actually a little bit skeptical of that. Period. Yeah, I feel like that's not a fair thing to ask of literature. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, as, as someone who is kind of in the middle of a uh, move from primarily working as a critic to doing more fiction material of my own, when I'm writing fiction, I'm not writing critiques of capitalism and, uh, and visions of the uh, future. I'm taking some ideas and playing with them and seeing what kind of story shakes out. If I wanted to write a vision of the future, you know, a plausible post-capitalist vision of the future, I'd look to a medium like the manifesto more than I'd look to a medium like the popular sci-fi. Uh, so I feel like that's an unfair thing, an unfair ask of literature. I think that that's misunderstanding the way in which literature and art is, uh, is political in a pretty cute way. So, one of the one of the things that I think that we we can kind of see, and this ties it to your other research um, in neo reaction, was that there were a bunch of trends in in the far right as what was called radical traditionalism, which was basically code word for people who pick up on elements of the most esoteric parts of fascist philosophy, like Julia Savola or mm -hmm. uh, Dugan before recently, um, back when he was just a coffee house post-fascist, um, that they ha had been building an apparatus that really didn't entirely work um, at, to attract people to it. You had to be into really arcane things to find this interesting. And also the, the its relationship to historical fascism was about an inch hidden, you know, mm -hmm. it, um, in the, in the late aughts, Richard Spencer, after he gets fired from, uh, from the American conservative magazine for being, well, who he is, and starts working with the National Policy Institute, um, it tries to rebrand this radical traditionalism as the alternative right, bringing a bunch of Gen X aesthetics. Uh, and initially, actually, they hid their racialism. I think people forget this, but very early on, they were it was coded. Um, It kind of doesn't go anywhere till 2015. Um, but, and so if you'd asked me in 2014, 2015, because I, I was following these circles, um, I would have, I would have thought that Neo Reaction a la uh, Memphis Moldbug, aka Curtis Chauvin, um, Nick Land, and a bunch of very strange collection of, of of writers would have been the more dominant one but one of the things i noticed that they did is kind of following nick land's early delusian work um they picked up a bunch of cyberpunk and biopunk aesthetics and how they presented themselves on blogs and whatnot um and a lot of their code words were related to this kind of genre of literature 
why do you think that was? And why do you think it seemed successful for a little while? Um, as uh, one of the observations that comes up in Near Reaction of Basilisk, and I, I have to credit this one to my uh, co-author on that essay, Jack Graham, who uh, mm -hmm. does a bunch of great stuff on his own. Fascists are desperate to feel cool. That is just one of their deeply ingrained motivations is they want to be cool, edgy rebels. Um, and that's, they're not obviously, um, they're literally the exact opposite of that, but they want a certain cool, rebellious uh, cachet. And cyberpunk more than any other sci-fi genre has been obsessed with being cool. It is a genre of, you know, in some ways, um, facile coolness, uh, but always coolness. Um, you know, it's a genre that has it, that has always had the kind of um, loner, socially maladapted outcast who's really secretly cool as its archetypal protagonist. And so I think it was always an easy vector for uh, for that. I think you can also, and this is kind of getting back to the um, springing out of Mark Fisher critique you mentioned earlier, you can look at a cyberpunk world and go, ah, but what if we wanted it to be this way and get a fascist utopian vision? Um, I mean, any good dystopia, if any honest dystopia will double as a utopia for a sufficiently evil person. Well, I mean, it, it is interesting to me because the C, the, for those of you who don't know, I mean, um, Nick Landon Fisher had a relationship um, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately it was often used uh, unfairly at Fisher. Um, their relationship was really before Nick Land had completely and totally had a mental breakdown and become a thought, fascist. Yeah, be, yeah, become a... Yeah, first became a weird paleo conservative, then a fascist outright, then some kind of weird, and uh, then some, kind of some fascist, post fascist accelerationist. Um, and it it was shocking to a lot of the people in that milieu because it felt now for people who have read like Zev Sternhell and know the history of classical fascism, it shouldn't be that shocking, but because usually. The, the the intellectual core not the not the voting base or our ground troops but the intellectual core of fascists tend to have a fair amount of defector marxist and anarchist in their ranks um but it seemingly did exactly what you said it it decided that you know what this thing that we're critiquing it's actually good yeah and um and I mean, I think land land speculative speculative nature in this is actually kind of uh, I mean, <laughs> it's actually even kind of hard to articulate because he he, for example, critiques white nationalism for not being racist and eugenicist enough because it would it would tolerate degenerate white people. Um, uh, he, I mean, he critiques, um, you know, his vision of accelerationism is not just transhuman, it literally and explicitly becomes anti-human. Like, you know, yeah. we're going to root for the Terminator. Um, right. I mean, Land's philosophy at the end of the day, um, when I was working on Near Reaction of Basilisk, I was talking with the uh, comics writer, uh, Kieran Gillen. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember that Kieran Gillen read a draft of it and talking about Nick Land specifically said, he's giving me a lot of ideas on how to write supervillains. Um, you know, Nick Land is kind of a real life Thanos or dark, uh, dark side character. Like he, mm -hmm. he really does look at annihilation of humanity and go, yes. I am into that. Right. Um, which is fucked up, uh, to put it mildly. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he is one of the places where you can really see how that 
um, how that counterculture fascist bleed can happen. Because, you know, he's starting off in a bunch of aesthetics that are fairly, not mainstream, but at least understandable. You know, a lot of those cyberpunk, post-human, frankly, goth aesthetics are already very like, you know, death. Death is cool. I will wear all black and listen to The Cure. Except, you know, he instead wore, wore all black, listened to The Cure, did way too much meth, went completely mad, and became a fascist, which is only a little bit different. Right. And it became... It, I mean, his fascism, unlike with some other neo-reactionary figures, became completely undeniable because he started promoting things around 2017 of, you know, the Order of Nine Angles, are, which is... You know, I mean, it explicitly fascist, satanic uh, conspiracy theorists who've actually meddled in the affairs of real life governments and killed people is not normally something that someone who wants to hide or have distance. Even someone like, say, uh, some of the people around Greca in France and the European New Right, like they would never have gone that far. Even Richard Spencer would have never gone that far. Um, but Nick Land legitimately wants to destroy the world, and so he has no problem. Right. I I honestly find, and at the end of the day, I still find Nick Land more sympathetic than Curtis Yarvin. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that because because you, because when I when you read say like Fang Numina, um, which I own somewhere, um, I I probably bought it like right before it was known where his politics were going. But if right. you read that in order, and it's presented in order, um, even though he says there's a hard break between his thought later, you know, his neo-reactionary thought and what he was writing then, you can actually kind of trace the steps like yeah. point by point by point, like each second. And you're like, oh, all you need is a, a lot of drugs and you might yeah, just I mean, go all the way down this path. I mean, if you look at even a lot of counterculture scenes, if you look at, um, you know, a lot of metal and post-metal musical mm-hmm. scenes that were playing with a lot of similar aesthetic ideas to what Nick Land was playing with, the same sort of, you know, let us be as goth and dark as it is possible to be. Um, in recent years, it's turned out that those scenes were comprised almost entirely of either Nazis or vehement anti-fascists who just weren't talking about their politics enough to find out that they were all there. Like, those scenes went in two very sharply fragmenting directions, um, because there's kind of two ways you can go when you're interested in those aesthetics. Um... Well, I think about Def in June. I mean, yes. in, in, in Neo Folk from the 80s, which was the first round of this, or I think about something that I was obsessed with in the 90s, the author for Feral House Press, who also yeah. did the same thing. They split amongst far leftist and explicit fascist, and then people who were explicit fascist and then either opted out or claimed to opt it out. Some of those people are questionable of whether or not they opted out or not. But, but it was, right. uh, you, you there, definitely there's, saw that. There's these whole aesthetic categories where if you're into them, every time you hear about a new band, step one is Google that band name Nazi and just double check. Um, right. and so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think that there is, there is something to be said about those aesthetics. There is something to look at in those aesthetics in the way in which th- And what I think those aesthetics are defined as, thinking about it and going a little off the cuff here, they're all aesthetics that are defined by going to an extreme for the sake of it. They really want to take something as far as it is possible to go. Um, Because other scenes that do this are like industrial music, noise music, um, a bunch of genres that are really... Bizarro fiction. Yeah, I mean, I'm still in arguments here in part, especially about industrial and uh, noise from my uh, friend Alex Reed, whose book Assimilate about industrial music. I'm cribbing some arguments from here. But these are genres that are very much about 
how far can we take it? Um, about aesthetic absolutes. Um, and when you are going to be that absolutist, you're going to end up on some sort of absolutist politics, whether it be the left absolutism of anarchism or Marxism or the right absolutism of fascism or whatever the fuck we want to call Nick Land's I want to destroy the world bullshit. Right. Well, I mean, this is this is actually interesting. I, I did laugh when people are like, well, Nick Land was an inspiration to the alt-right. And I'm like, the alt-right existed before him. But um me explicitly even the magazine and there was like a weird split in like 2011 and yeah i mean like um i i have spent way too much of my life following people out of what for me a completely different path i came out of these aesthetic scenes but i also um and i have not even until talking to you thought about how those scenes may or may not have contributed with me getting pulled into a paleo conservative direction and right. then seeing where they were going um, and freaking the fuck out. I've talked about on my way out of that. I start, I'd actually had a correspondence with Richard Spencer at one point. Um, and I have, you know, I read a lot of these uh, U- European new right figures um, and a lot of them started out in religious alternative subculture kind of things and not the ones you'd expect like the first european new right book i ever encountered was elaine de beniste on being pagan um it was not you know the stuff we think about now now that book's like 20 years old now or maybe more than that but it's it's uh it's interesting how it comes out of these subcultures and it was also interesting that before 2000 and say 14 they also they used way more coded language than they do now. Um, yeah, 2014 feels like a turning point to me. Yeah, because I remember, for example, instead of them just admitting they were white nationalists, they talk about human biodiversity, which, of course, was cribbed from actually a left-wing uh, anthropologist who I used to even know his name, um, who was making the opposite point of what they were, but they took right. the name. Um, and... Um, there was a whole lot of concern. There was a whole lot of attempt to like get in on the pagan movement. Now, yeah, there's the obvious ones like, um, like folkish Astro and stuff like that, which are, which have lended themselves to this way before anything like, all right. But it wasn't just that, like there was in a, there was a kind of active attempt to get into things that were at least considered liberal adjacent, like Wicca in general paganism. Um, but what was interesting during the neo-reactionary period of like 2013, 2014, 2015 was I started also reading neo-reactionary Catholics and, and like people that who priorly would have just been paleo conservatives and been like in the backs of, of maybe Sobrens are, uh, you know, the, the parts of the Ameri- of American conservative are talking mag that people don't really pay attention to. But right. um, that they were now rebranding themselves as hip and cool, but also traditionalist and this, that, and the other. And that at first didn't make sense to me because I was like, how in the hell can a Catholic read Nick Land and think they're even remotely on the same side, even if they're both explicitly fascist? Like, I don't understand that world. And the only thing I could figure was like, it was some kind of aesthetic drift. It wasn't. It wasn't ideological or theological or or even epistemological. That it was a kind of political and aesthetic allegiance, and that was about it. Um, but I think honestly, I think Catholic is even there. You know, among the I um I was raised Catholic, and so this you know we're, we're drawing on my childhood traumas here a bit. Um, but even there, you know, more than other. Uh, flavors of Christianity. Catholicism is really like the one that's going to get deep into like, let's glorify the wounds of Christ. There's always been a kind of body horror extremism to to Catholicism that obviously, yes, there are some very stark differences between that and Nick Land, but there's an extremism to Catholic Catholicism. It does have a sort of aesthetic extremism within Christianity. Yeah, well, I think you also see that in certain fra- flavors of Orthodox Christianity, too, such as, like, not to damn all of uh, Russian Orthodoxy, um, 
particularly before a current political arrangements. But um, for example, Father Seraphim Rose style and right. Death to the World. Because I encountered that. This, that's actually something I encountered in my transition out of kind of zine, working class kid zine culture, um, surrounded by a bunch of really obnoxious uh, Pentecostals and Baptists. And, you know, being, and my background's Jewish and Catholic. So, um, and so it's, so that's hostile. But then you encounter something like the death to the world movement, um, which was, super punk hyper i would not even say conservative hyper reactionary eastern orthodox seraph and rose style right um, and all these seem like precursor arrangements but they weren't really they weren't in dialogue with each other until the aught teens like they, they don't right. seem like they were really like there was no coordination nobody was like trying to brand themselves as alt right or near reaction and i'm actually surprised alt right won i think it literally is only because of the hillary clinton speech that's the one that 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 stuck but probably yeah but um cuz it's the least descriptive in some ways and um even its founder had tried like spencer had tried to abandon that until then and then picked it back up as a moniker right. it's very weird um but I think the other thing Land did, and then we can talk about Yarvin for a bit, is not only did he take the cyberpunk aesthetic appeal, but unlike all these other aesthetic movements or religious movements, he actually had a pretty deep engagement with left-wing and, and also post-left-wing, post-structuralist literature. Right. So, He's somewhat unique among um, the hmm. far right in having read and to a meaningful extent understood, say, Marx. Yeah, um, um, yeah. I think whereas, and Dugan are the only two I can think of. Like, right, um, because one of the things that really characterizes a lot of far-right thought, if we're being honest, is extreme stupidity. Um, and that doesn't tend to include doing the reading. Um, I mean, this transitions right into Yarvin. Uh, for all that, uh, you know, one, one of the observations I make in my book is that for all the raving uh, Yarvin does about communism, he literally never engages with Marx. Yeah. Like, not even the token, like, engage with the communist manifesto um, level. As far yeah, as not even like one can tell, level like this. Like, yeah. Right. Like, as far as one can tell, he's literally never fucking read a page of Marx. Um, and I think Land, you know, again, in as much as I want to give Land credit, Land at least finds that a little embarrassing. I think Land is inclined to do the reading. But this does bring me to Yarvin because Yarvin's been the only one of these figures that I saw from 10 years ago that wasn't part of an older order. So we could talk about like Paul Gottfried or somebody who yeah. uh, was an established academic and a conservative writer going all the way back to the 70s. Um, whereas... And who has also never explicitly endorsed fascism, although he's definitely showed up on fascist programs and podcasts and whatnot. Um, right. Whereas Yarvin had a really weird route in. Yeah, Yarvin had a really weird route in, and it wasn't and it wasn't hidden. But he has been of these figures. He's been the one who has. I'm not going to say gone mainstream, but he is welcome in, say, national conservative discourses, which are increasingly closer to the mainstream. Um, right. Whereas, like, Nick Land is really unlikely to appear on Tucker Carlson. Right. Exactly. And, 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 and or even, you know, in Talking Mag or something, like, they're not right. going to touch that. Like, um, you know, because also, like anyone who's sincerely religious, we're gonna talk about like he's gonna even freak them out. Like he's he, the quiet parts are said not only too loud, but as giant robots with tentacles. Like right. Um. So it's interesting. So what? How? What do we make of Yarvin? I mean, like it. It, it was. I mean, I remember when we figured out who, who he was because back in the early like. Again, we talk about this time. It's a lot seemed to happen in 2014, but right. like we were all speculating on who Minch's mole bug really was. No one really knew. Right. So, um, what's the actual question here? 
So how do you think Yarvin was able to do that? Why is he the figure that's been able to break out, even though he has some of the same aesthetics and has some of the, ex- I mean, no, he's never endorsed the order of nine angles, but if you read like letters to young progressive or something like that, um, he, he takes just, he's only a step and a half back from where land is going. Right. I think the, I mean, the extremely straightforward answer is Yarvin came up through a kind of geeky tech scene. Um, Yarvin and I actually turned out to have in different years and um, places, but we turned out to have gone to the same gifted and talented summer camp uh, as like teenagers. Um, He came out of a scene of rich, uh, middle, upper middle class, uh, people, the sort of people who had computers in their houses in the early 80s. Um, he's a programmer. He was in, he was on the kind of weird outskirts of Silicon Valley tech culture because what he wanted to do was weird and uncommercial. Um, it was brilliant in the sense of that is an amazing concept that has no applications. Um, and he caught the eye of Peter Field. Um, that's the extremely simple cut all of the numinous factors out of it. He caught the eye of uh, a fascist with a, a fascist geek with a lot of money. Right. And, um, and that, that seems very different than, say, the CCRU. And uh, we also should point out that Nick Land's the only one of the CCRU to go far right that I know of. Right. For the most part, the CCRU are broadly lovely people. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, like uh, Reza uh, uh, Nigrastani is uh, Nigrastani is uh, is a leftist. Uh, Mark Fisher was a leftist. Um, Ray Bra- uh, Ray Brazier is at least not a rightist. I wouldn't necessarily say he's a leftist, but right, like <laughs> they're they're probably all people you don't have to feel actively bad about being interested in. In the same way that when you're interested in Nick Land, you just have bad feelings about it. When you're interested in Nick Land, you have things to talk to your therapist about. Yeah, it, it is interesting. And um, one of the insights of a book that I that I was highly critical of when I helped publish it, um, <laughs> uh, Kill All Normies. Um, Ah. I, uh, yeah, um, that's your fault. No, it's not my fault. Uh, okay. I, um, I long story. Um, I wrote a um a two page critique of that book when we went through it, and I said, I said the, and I only had, and I didn't know this, four of the chapters in the book. All right. Um, to judge. So I read the chapters on transgression and on the internet culture. And I was like, well, there's a whole history that Nagel doesn't seem to know or be interested in. Here's what she would need to look up. Here's the books. Here's his book on radical traditionalism. Here's, uh, I think I even told her to read conservative uh, uh, right-wing critics of American conservatism. Um, a bunch of like the scholarly work on, on the predecessor movements. Um, right. And then I was, um, and then we accept, and then we accepted it with my caveat. Um, and then they added four more chapters that the reviewers never saw that only the prime editor saw. Um, yeah, you, you, you can really see that book as like the exact turning point for zero books to <laughs> not be good anymore. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have, uh, just not to defend Zero, um, I'm actually going to go the opposite direction. I think that Zero's always published questionable stuff because, for example, even when Mark Fisher was involved, um, they had a pretty strong relationship to Spiked. Um, that's, that like, that isn't from Doug Lane. But yeah. not to relitigate that, I, as a person who was implicated by it, I, I did actually say something about that book. And then I, um, and I, I don't talk about this much. I actually told Doug Lane a year before the Tucker thing happened or the American prospect that I thought Nagel um, was a nationalist and had hot and had hit it. And um, that it was unfortunate because parts of the kill on normies was correct, but 
then people started pointing out more and more of the book. And I read the book and I was like, wait, this is not the book that I remember accepting. There's more in here. Um, yeah. And then the plagiarism scandal came out and I was like, you did what? Like you didn't, you didn't check this now. Admittedly, mo I, I now worked in publishing. Nobody checks shit anymore, but I was no. really surprised. I mean, like, I was really all that staff that's that. getting laid off from the publishing companies are the people whose job to check shit. Right. Well, I mean, true facts. I never actually worked and neither did even Doug Lane for zero books. We were private per diem contractors. I mean, zero always had that weird fucked up. Sometimes they're a vanity press and sometimes they're not thing going on. Right. Well, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. And like they stopped, yeah. they stopped doing that around 2018 but it was, yeah, it's a whole different thing. But what's interesting about that is the, the I was about to say the one key insight Nagel does have, even though she seems to herself do it later on, is the way that the addiction to transgression is a whole, even for very law and order style politics, and and that's that's a seeming paradox. But I think that does get to this aesthetic thing that you're talking about too, because yeah, if you go you, you go to these subcultures, they tend to be, they tend to have. Some of them, I think, are, when I say this, this is not a critique of their politics, and some of these people, I think, are actually correct. But they tend to have quote extremophile politics, like you have gone one way or the other, um, mm -hmm. um and so, I was going to ask you, do we know of? of cyberpunk writers who went right wing before the CCRU? Like, is there a relationship here indirectly? There were, uh, let's see, there's one, I'm forgetting the author's name. I believe the book was called Dreams of Flesh and Sand. Uh, that was an early cyberpunk book, a bit of an also ran, but its uh, author is uh, extremely far right. Uh, something Quick, I think is his surname. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else. I mean, there's Neil Stevenson. He's always a bit of a, what are your politics? It's good that you don't say. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, and also when I read Neil Stevenson, it seems to really change from book to book. Um, Cause there's some, there's some pretty, so, so, there's some sketch implications in like Cryptonomicon and, uh, and his early books, he seems like a libertarian. Um, right. I, I think I think Stevenson is probably broadly libertarian, uh, probably on the nicer end of libertarian, but also the weird sort of libertarian who does actually understand the full scope of it and so isn't unfriendly with the horrible parts. Right. I mean, if you've ever read Hans Hermann Hoppe, you, you, you know where this is going to go, right? Like, right. Uh, and which... Which was another interesting thing about about Nick Land is even about say paleo libertarianism. He's he's not going to be one of the one of the people that they're going to endorse because, like say, like say Hans Hammer and Hop, the quiet parts are then said explicitly out loud, and the trajectory of people like Stefan Molyneux um, become mm -hmm. a lot more obvious. It doesn't seem like a deviation. Um, or someone like people who may know who have a long history for the right wing, but this is one of the things that kind of got me out of it was a uh, Lou Rockwell's association with neo Confederates and with people like Gary North and, and Rush Dooney who were out and out the theocrats. Um, right. Um, so, but what was interesting about them and I think maybe a predecessor to some of this stuff too, is they would write, like you could go to Lou Rockwell and see a defense of Foucault and Derrida because they would be picking up on what like Matt McManus would say now is like the, po like the conservatism's like both hatred of, but use of postmodernism. And they yeah. would kind of make that, they would actually just kind of state it um, more openly. So it's just interesting to me uh, when we talk about this, because I've been thinking about this time period where, this stuff was existed and was going on for 30 years before kind of it became a pop, like anything that Democrats talked about. Yeah. Um, um, why do you think 
it was it was kind of kept hush hush for so long. I think there was there's a degree to which um, things move very slowly, then very quickly. Mm. You know, to go back to that that old chestnut. Um, once these various you know tiny fringe things on the right started linking up in earnest and gaining some momentum, uh, they started linking up quite quickly. Um, Once there was, once there were institutions with actual power uh, behind it, as opposed to weird fringe magazines, um, everyone kind of flocked to where there was power. Um, You know, it took a while for the uh, rightward drift of of the Republican Party to get there to where it nominated Trump, I mean, that's obviously kind of the decisive transition point. Um, But once it did, obviously everyone got behind that because finally some flavor of this thing that they wanted was there. And no one at that point really cared about the fact that they were a bunch of, you know, fundamentalist Christians in the same bandwagon as the weirdo tech Satanists. Right. Well, I mean, this this does bring, I mean, it does bring an interesting sort of dynamic to this, though, because I was thinking about how the Trump moment, um, in some ways, kind of like the left moment under Biden, um, led to people being overconfident. I mean, we think about what happened in in um, um, in two thousand seventeen. Um, with the unite the right rally, and yeah. you see what you saw is this this kind of boisterousness with all these explicit fas- fascists coming out, um, and then it kind of falls apart for them very very quickly. But I think you're seeing it to the same ex- uh, in another sense with um, Roe v. Wade and the um, like. Man, if you had just waited five or ten years between Roe v. Wade and attempting to criminalize a ten-year-old getting a uh, rape victim getting an abortion, that would have gone a lot better for you. But because you went straight from Roe v. Wade to criminalize the ten-year-old in literally days, it's going worse for them. But I agree with you. But in both these these scenarios, there has been like well, in, in the case of the Roby Ray criminalizing a 10-year-old, there's been 50 years of drift with the extremist on this. Um, right. in, the case, in the case of the alt-right, I think there's been 30. I think I think when, when Pat Buchanan... Um, challenged Bush in 92. Challenged Bush in 92 and failed, that that is when a lot of the... And, and Joe Sobrin was purged from the National Review. Um mm-hmm. That is when a lot of uh, oh yeah, and, and San Francisco was purged from there. I mean, people who don't know these old, and the thing is, these people would have no if you show Sham Francis to even a twenty year old fascist, they're not. They might read that. They might read some of his books now and be and be fascinated. But if they saw him or saw him at these conservative rallies in the nineties, he would have immediately turned them off. Similarly. Um, after that, we see David Duke run in Louisiana. Um, we see the militia movement, but that really didn't appeal to young people. Like, right. Um, and so, neo reaction is interesting to me, and even more interesting to me than say Spencer's alt right, because it did appeal to young people, mm-hmm. um, and that's what changed. I mean, and and young people from a generation that, in cultural terms. It's pretty left wing, um, in right. economic terms, probably more left wing than we've seen since the '40s. But in cultural mm-hmm. terms, even more left wing. So, like, how much does this aesthetic do you think really play into this? I think this is the question I'm always like going back and forth. Is it substance or aesthetic here? Or when does one become the other? I mean, I if you want to talk about young people getting radicalized to the far right. Sure, Neo Reaction caught a couple. Um, Mm. But the thing you really need to talk about if you're going to talk about young people and and the far right is Gamergate. 
That is the mm-hmm. turning point on that specifically. That is when a formula was figured out to funnel, uh, not even, you don't even want to say young people categorically. What you really want to say is nerd. disaffected, nerd, <laughs> disaffected white men who, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, uh, running straight into the jaws of an economy that means that the lifestyle they grew up with in their middle class homes is not available to them and never will be. Right. Although, um, interestingly, that is also the same demographic for most of the far left. Sure. Well, but not the white men. That's the thing. That is the wedge issue that uh, that Gamergate used. Um, Gamergate successfully realized that you can split young, uh, split specifically white men off from the rest of the younger cohort by looking at these trends toward diversity in media and saying, look, you're getting cut out of everywhere. It's not just the economics. It's also movies. Never mind that movies aren't about you anymore. Literally just means one of the 20 Marvel movies had a fucking girl. in it. Like, never mind. This is all complete bullshit. It was an, it with Gamergate was proven to be an effective recruitment tactic. Um, Gamergate was absolutely huge in taking guys who previously just wanted to be um, low-grade assholes in the forums of like Penny Arcade or some shitty webcomic and suddenly get them reading Breitbart. It was an incredibly effective pipeline for that. And we've seen that playbook repeated on the backlash to Star Wars The Last Jedi, the backlash to, I mean, the whole Snyder Cut uh, thing was another version of that reacting against Marvel movies. You saw a version of it in comic books uh, that literally just called itself comics gate. Um, you saw it with the ghostbusters movie was probably the earliest version of, of it. And you've just seen this playbook repeated over and over. It just happened again with Amber Heard um, over and over again. Uh, the far right has realized you can radicalize uh, young white men specifically by um, stoking paranoia about diversity. And that's where that happened. New York Action, I think, had a negligible role in uh, recruiting young people to the far right. My only pushback on that would be the national conservative movement it seems to have figured out how to do that, but not just for white men. Go on. Well, um one of the things that we have seen amongst the, about amongst the national conservatives is one a focus on increasing diversity particularly amongst latin and and uh southeast asian uh communities and and explicitly in their leadership look at the names um uh on a lot of their magazines now um and right. to and i think this was a tactic that i that i think was picked up from from the natural limits of this like there's no, like, yeah, I, I agree with you. This has been a nerd culture war thing. Um, and one that I, I will honestly say uh, that I think we also have to put some blame on liberals for this because they they bait it all the time, not into the versification of, of the movies, but in explicitly the way they were marketing this and trying to play this off um, to settle off demographics. I think about the, the, the backlash to the not the current Star uh, Ghostbusters movie, but the but the prior all female Ghostbusters movie, right? The twenty fourteen one, yeah. Uh, which was, I mean, it wasn't bad because because of a diversity of the cast. It was bad because it was poorly written. But, right. um, um, but no, I mean the the thing that is not owned up to enough on the left and i think specifically amidst um leftist media is a lot of the time the diversity really is superficial and for its own sake there is a lot of cynical diversity that is marketing to hillary clinton voters um a lot you know uh captain marvel is a bland white woman girl power movie there is nothing actually radical in their other uh, radical in their I was going to say other, but no, I'm, I'm going to leave the other off. Um, yeah. I would say that it's Top Gun, but girl, with girl boss vibes. So yeah, it's, like it's girl boss Top Gun. That is Captain Marvel. Um, a lot of these things 
that are, I think, pretty cynical in their diversity and really just doing diversity um, for the sake of it exist. Um, And those things are easy targets. They're soft targets. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially to people who are used to being the default setting, which is where, you know, the young uh, white men come in. And yeah, I mean, that playbook can be expanded to settings other than American young white men, um, as you note, but that is where that playbook started. That is right. where, you know, that is what everything else is a variation. I um, was going to ask you, like, do you think <coughs> all this Chappelle stuff is actually an attempt to do this for a different demographic? Um, I don't know. I mean, to some extent, it's also true that the far right, you don't even have to say the far right, the right has always been smart about elevating their token black voices. Fair, yes. Um, and in this um, case, no one, one, no one does more transparent affirmative action than the right. Uh, I mean, even explicit, I, I think about like Nixon's, like Nixon as they're developing the Southern strategy is also like trying to peel off black entrepreneurs in in specific development stuff. And I think about, I mean, Alex Haley was a Nixonite which is something I think yeah. people don't even know. Like, like it's, it's a very straight, it's an old tactic. It's a, it's a successful tactic to, um, to a successful tactic to a very small sliver of the population. Um, right. Um, I mean, I, I, there are, there are some great essays out there. I, I would have to do some Googling, but I've read some great essays on how Clarence Thomas actually does come out of a radical black, tra- black tradition. Yeah. Corey Robbins you, has written on it. Yeah. That's probably the one I've read. It, I mean, it, it's a great bit of reading to do if you've never, if you've never Googled that. Yeah. Um, I, so I guess one of the things I think is interesting about this is in both the left press and the liberal press, there was this, I, there was like this war, I feel like from 2015 to about last year where we were arguing that either economics mattered or culture mattered. And it seems <laughs> yeah. very clear to me that like both matter and they were feeding into each other. <laughs> um, right. I mean, the only economics matter side certainly misses the fact that I'm going to go in the camp, a lot, uh, get shoved into the camps a lot sooner than they are when the fascists mm-hmm. take over. And that that gets to matter to me. I get to care about that. Um, and the culture people fail miserably to realize that Hillary Clinton was uh, never going to do jack shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, both of those were very vapid viewpoints. Um, and I do, I am heartened by the idea that we're moving past that. I'm not sure I see it as having moved past yet, but I'm heartened by the idea. I, I, I don't know if we've moved past it or if things have gotten so bad that we just stopped the debate. But yeah. Um, it does seem like people have gone, huh, a lot of this reactionary culture stuff is happening in poorer parts of the country, but not from people who are poor. I wonder what is going on, but right, <laughs> right. It's, it's all the people who own the, who own the used car dealerships in rural Pennsylvania. Right. Exactly. Um, and it is interesting also in a lot of like these per- these rural purple state areas where this is really really intense um mm-hmm. uh but it, it, it's interesting to me because i think i think there is a far leftist you know as we're talking about near reaction but i think far leftists have a tendency to to look at what we feel is our analog on the other side and maybe give them more importance than they than they actually have because you know, someone was talking to me about Dugan, and I was like, "Look, I, it is weird in the last year that now Putin has adopted some rhetoric that doesn't straight out of that." But I'm also gonna say I've been talking to Russians for 20 years, and they have never told me that he was an actual threat. That most of it was always a joke, whether or not he was a Eurasianist or a national Bolshevik or whatever. Um, now. I guess maybe what we learn from something like the adoption of Eurasianist rhetoric by a major world powers uh, president 
even if that's not where he's getting his policy and is totally cynical, that it does provide some kind of intellectual groundwork and new way of talking. And I think we even see this in some ways with, with Trump and Bannon where, um, I mean, Trump was awful, um, but in some ways I like to point out that his awfulness is actually a continuity of the Republican party, not a divergence. And like, if you actually look at the policies, there are some places where there is divergence. Um, but most of it was just, they didn't hide shit anymore. Like, right. I mean, the thing that I think is important with Trump is to keep a clear difference between the ways in which he was awful because he, uh, hitched his wagon to fascism and the ways in which he was awful because he was a idiot narcissist. Mm -hmm. um, and those are two very different things. Um, and sometimes they combined with astonishing toxicity, as in January 6th, the, the attempt at a coup, which is fundamentally Trump's narcissism and inability to believe that he lost an election, tying in with a bunch of forces on uh, the right who were like, ooh, coup, we've been waiting for this. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of the time, well, not most of the time, but very often they played against each other in ways that were useful for the left because Trump was too much of an incompetent kleptocrat to get anything done. Right. Well, yeah, I, I've been, I've been <laughs> sort of warning about that because I'm like, you know, eventually, and I think eventually it's even going to be someone like DeSantis who actually comes out of the Republican machine more explicitly than Trump. Um, mm -hmm you're going to get one of these people who is both competent and not an outsider. Um, no, I don't think any of them are competent. I, I do not believe in any of their competence because if DeSantis was competent, he would have fucking stepped in on COVID. COVID was a stupid stance to take. There is no reason to kill that man, much of your population for no, uh, over nothing. He had a thousand culture war issues he could have picked and he chose to kill a massive swath of the population of Florida. That's stupid and incompetent. He's actually an idiot. They're all idiots. That just doesn't make them any less dangerous is the problem. We want to believe that someone being stupid is actually like an advantage over them and it's not. Um, well, I mean, what we have to look at competency, competency in an interesting way because I would I would actually also argue that Biden's has totally Biden's CDC is totally fucked up. Oh, absolutely. It's like I don't, I don't think there's I a competent machine politics. I don't think Period. machine politics Democrats are competent. I think mostly people who want power are incompetent. I think that's really the underlying problem is that people who look at the world and go, I want power over it tend to be fucking idiots. I guess what I, what I mean by competence is more someone who's not that much of a narcissist that they can be played that easily. Right. That was Trump's. That is Trump's Achilles heel, actually, is that. Right. And Bi Biden's is subtly different. Biden is instead a naive institutionalist. Right. What do you um, deal with, with? What if you got a cynical institutionalist and competent fuck? Like, that's a different. Um, then you just have Bush and Reagan, and frankly, that was better. Like fundamentally, if the Republican Party goes back to being to being George W. Bush stupid, that is a win right now. And it's not praise for Bush on any level, but it's better than fucking fascists who are going to put me in a camp. At least under Bush, I didn't worry about going into a fucking concentration camp. That was nice. I liked that. I liked not worrying about that. Mm. <clears throat> but the thing is and obviously that's not a defense of Bush or Reagan or anything no, no. else. It's just how much worse it is now. But I, I I'm I'm also But everything is a continuity of the shit they prayed before. Sure, obviously there's a historical progression from Bush through Obama to Trump. You can see exactly how Bush causes Obama causes Trump in the popular shifts. I'm not denying that Bush was a precursor to all of this. It's just a little less murderous, and I liked that. I liked well, that. <laughs> I, I guess my, my my I guess I guess what I'm thinking is like, but 
how do you keep it from going murderous? Because that you don't, is you don't. But... I mean, ca- capitalism was always going to go mur- murderous and extinctionist. Like fundamentally, that's what climate change is. There's not a good way out of capitalism. I don't actually think we're going to roll roll back. I mean, even if we do roll back to the Republican Party is only as bad as Bush again. Okay, then in thirty years the planet cooks and we all die anyway. This isn't a way out. You know, I'm right. not plotting any sort of visionary escape in, uh, escape in this. Um, I'm just saying I think that fundamentally the cynical institutionalist isn't as bad. Mm. I guess I guess my question is like. Because I look at this in a, I spent the last 10 years outside of the United States. Uh, well, I spent eight of the last 13 years outside of the United States, the last five. And for almost all of Trump, I was here. Um, the, what I've seen elsewhere is that the cynical institutionalists can become Trump's pretty easily. Um, and that's what I'm really more concerned about Uh, because i think about i mean i think about this in the context of the right-wing rise pretty much everywhere that we're that that there's that's actually in the core of capital in some places that aren't um none of the a lot of them are not as gauche or as obvious or as far as um as trump was but then there are plenty that are worse um and so i'm wondering about how we fight this as a trajectory because this seems to be where things are headed like um i mean we don't fight it within liberal capitalism liberal capitalism is just the less immediately unpleasant state of uh state of affairs on the march toward climate apocalypse at the end of the day at the end of the day if you ask me how we fight this and we're talking about political allegiances in a given country the tipping point on climate change is probably a couple of years behind us now yeah i, I like, think we have to we do sequester it. that's that we missed it um yeah. it's the collapse of the liberal of the global liberal capitalist hegemony is going to happen now. Yeah. There is no way out of that. Agreed. Climate change was was the death knell for it. What we are seeing now is a horrifying zombie corpse, and that horrifying zombie corpse is going to help kill billions of people. The ones that climate change isn't going to get on its own. But it's going to be very, very ugly. And there is absolutely no way out that is through our current politics. There is no vote that you can make that is going to help in the fucking slightest right now. Agreed. Except the one the one exception I will make to that is exclusively on the local level. Because I think in the wake of the collapse of that capitalist hegemony that we're going to see what is going to matter absolutely most in the world is where you are and what the politics and culture of the specific place that you are is you know i I, i'm in ithaca new york which is one of the only good things i see about the future uh for me as a trans woman right now is ithaca new york is an extremely progressive well-educated town that will hold its shit together longer than just about anywhere else in the country until you run um, out of food, which would be pretty cool. We're in an agricultural region. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually know the agricultural regions of the country, and yes, you are, but you're in one that is not super productive. Um, we're productive enough to feed ourselves. I mean, like, I, it's a perfectly, it is as good a bet, I think, on how to survive the, you know, how to survive the next 50 years is probably live somewhere like this and vote in the elections and make sure that your government and your local culture stays progressive, stays having remotely tolerable values. And when it all comes down, hope to hell you pull through it. That's what I've got. Hmm. It's a horrible, ugly prognosis. Like it, it's, not utopian in the least it's out of this rubble there might be some reasonably nice places that don't all eat each other 
Um, I don't like it. It's terrifying, but that's about the best I've got. There's nothing in electoral politics whatsoever that has hope. It's it's an interesting thing to think about because there's been there's been ten years now of of a left that that had previously, um, I think correctly, um, not been willing to play in electoral politics because they knew the odds were so low. Mm-hmm. Um, where I see things have gone in the last ten years is unfortunately that hope may have made a lot of people kind of stupid. Um, Mm -hmm. um, And I think for me, the the summation of that was the number of leftists who seriously thought that while they weren't going to get what they were asking for, for Bernie, that Biden had made sincere concessions in that first couple of speeches in the first 90 days. And that there had been a significant change in the democratic party. And I think we really do have to be completely um, completely open about the fact that, that that was delusional, just out and out. Yes. But um, I mean, frankly, I think Bernie was delusional too. Oh, I the mean, I do too, can, but that, that's right, like... like the, <laughs> the idea that you can put someone at the head of this fundamentally broken machine and they will fix how the machine works is delusional. Yeah. Well, I, this is, this has been something that I've been trying to tell people for a long time because I was like, okay, if you want a Bernie to work, you would have had to have been building local political coalitions for the past really generation um, to even have a chance. And that is before donors get involved. Mm-hmm. Um you haven't done that. Uh, you nope. you couldn't have done that, but you also have not attempted to do it. Um, and so, what you're doing effectively is giving people false hope, and unfortunately, that means that they are not doing things that they need to do. Because I I, I have actually been with you on advocating only engaging in local politics and mostly to stop shit from happening not to actually do it like yeah what you know because at this point the federalization of politics means that even if the somehow the beast survives the next 50 years that it it will be almost functionally decoupled um Mm -hmm. uh clarence thomas seems to be personally invested into destroying the 14th amendment so um that like and if that happens you're right i mean um, basically the the legalization of entire populations of people will be possible at the local level and there's nothing the federal government seems to to even be willing to do about it um you right you know and it wouldn't even that parts of it wouldn't be that hard for it to do but it's not interested in doing it because of a set of other reasons that have incentivized a bunch of bullshit we, we we're completely in agreement on that um it's just hard to imagine now if if for example um you're in Ithaca New York mm-hmm. right but i would uh, people who feel safe just cuz of the state they're in i think Ooh, are, don't do are, that no. are uh, <laughs> like i'm going to be fine in slc my state's red as hell but um but if you're in california and yeah if you're in the bay area or or la sure fine if you're in Orange County or Redding or it ain't gonna be Sacramento. It, it, the right there is actually probably even scarier than the right here in Utah. Right. Um, I mean, states are not a meaningful, are not going to be a meaningful structure in, the, in any sort of crack up that we're going to see. Right. Um, I don't, I think it is reasonably likely that the U.S. is heading to a civil war within the next 20 years. I don't think it will be a war between the states anymore. It will be a war within the states. Well, 
when I game theory that out, um, what I what I end up with is that happens, and then we immediately have a military junta that that suppresses a lot of people, but nothing fundamentally changes, and then you have days of lead for thirty years. Um, this is awfully big to rule. Um, that's, I think that's true. I, I think that you're likely to have some regional regional uh, cracks that happen. No, I mean, um, Texas could easily fall off california could easily fall off um right like i think that it's reasonably likely that you'll see the west and east coasts go in a different direction than like a texas florida center of power that ends up being the seat of the mil of the military uh dictatorship you know i think i think you're likely to not see a singular u.s come out of that Um, and I think the coin flip is probably the Northeast because it has New York City and it has too much money. Right. Um, that's the one. I honestly don't know how that one will go. Uh, I guess I guess I'll find out. Well, this got exceedingly dark, but I mean, we start we start off talking about cyberpunk dystopias. I mean, the, the thing. What I find interesting in this, in the United States, the one thing that I find almost progressively naive about cyberpunk that I think mm -hmm. would have been, that projecting from the 1980s, I think made total sense, was that the corporations would actually hold things together more than they seem to be willing to do. Right. Um, that's that's the thing that I think is actually now, which used to read as totally dystopic actually seems a bit optimistic. Um, yeah. That's an interesting shift. Um, and that's, that's something I don't know what to do with yet. Um, you know, one of my current projects is actually trying, is actually doing a cyberpunk novel of my own and yeah, I'm not doing corporate takeover, but the role of where exactly business and money and how that works is, uh, big question marks about there for me well it's interesting for me too because i because i've had to talk about i've had to deal with the fact that i think on cultural issues ca capital has been a cynically has been a cynical progressive force um mm -hmm. like we talked about the superficiality a lot of it but the idea that capital was never going to like change its cultural norms that i think a lot of leftists that i knew in the 90s kind of assumed um, that basically we were going to be ruled by chamber, like super conservative reactionary chambers of commerce forever. Um, that's not exactly true, but the progressivism right. I, these corporations put on author also isn't that meaningful. So, right. I think the central naivete there was, and I think this actually gets at a larger naivete about cyberpunk and the uh, nature and utility of certain kinds of power. In a country where 71% of the population approves of same-sex marriage, which is what the United States is at mm -hmm. these days, there is simply not that much money in being vocally homophobic. Unless you're the, a politician, apparently. Unless you're appealing, unless you're trying to appeal to a specific uh, niche of about 29% of the country. Right. Which admittedly is the Republican Party's electoral strategy, but it's not Disney's. Um, and I think that cyberpunk fails to theorize the fact that corporations still need consumers. Right. Um, and that consumers exert certain kinds of power. Um and that's, yeah, that's one of the factors that I think is very under-theorized about what's going to happen next is exactly how the fact that actually genocidal racism and killing all the trans people doesn't poll very well is going no. to play out. I, well, um, I mean, that that's the, I mean, that's, the, I was actually talking to someone about this about the rise of evangelicals and I was like, okay, yeah, uh, this literally came up today actually. And I was like, in one hand, you're completely right. And the other hand, culturally, they're dying. Like they are declining in membership and in and in cultural growth and in cultural importance. The only area in which they've had growth is is an alliance with Catholic judges. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
that which is not does not make them not dangerous actually it makes them extremely dangerous that's not my my point my point is like you have you, you have you're positing a situation where 29% of the country and attitude is going to try to dictate um 70% of the culture's cultural values and, and sure, they'll pull 10 or 15% along with them in that because right. some of that 71% is soft support that will that will swing with the wind. But fundamentally, there's a math there that isn't going to work out even medium term. Right. And, and even um, in places like Texas, frankly. So it's like... Right. Like there is a there is an egregious failure. On, and this is getting back to what we were talking about, about the overconfidence of the right. There is an egregious failure to consider the reality of um the consent of the governed mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and but we, we are a country it's like right I'm like and on the other hand and I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about the consent of the governed because i don't think the because the governed gave way too much consent in the trump era like the consent of the governed is gonna consent to a lot more bullshit than i would have hoped but i think there but there is a breaking point there somewhere Roe v. Wade is already showing you that there was a breaking point. That was an overstep. That but, was, in point of fact, an overstep that is going to cost the right dearly. Um, I gotta head off soon, but I'll close with um, the single thing that gives me the most hope, because I've been extremely cynical here. You've actually um, cynical me, which is hard. So yeah. I try. I try to be pretty... <laughs> I'm a pretty bleak person a lot of the time, I'll admit. Um, I re- Not long after New Reaction Basilisk came out, I read a short uh, piece by Douglas Rushkoff where he described being flown in at massive expense. Like this was the single biggest uh, source of money for him in the year it happened by a couple of Silicon Valley execs for a, like, couple-hour um, consulting session. And what all of them were interested in, like, there was a little bit of chit-chat. They were all talking about, you know, the event as some sort of inevitable uh, soci- you know, societal collapse that they were preparing for. And what they couldn't figure out and wanted Douglas Rushkoff's help with was how do we keep our security staff from killing us and taking over? And Rushkoff, you know, describes going, have you tried paying them well? And then like just not not hearing him. And it's this clear moment of here is where it is all going to go wrong for the right. No matter how everything over the next 50 years plays out, the thing that the right will fail on is when their security staff kills and eats them. Well, I, this is this is. I pointed this out about the military. I was like, I was like, look, there's like a third of the military is right wing loons, but the other two thirds are either apolitical or people of color. So I don't know what you think that's gonna. Right, like really sure, go. maybe the military, maybe in a coup, the military back. Um, Trump, but fundamentally the military needs to be fed, feeding people costs money, and money is much more divided on this. Right, well, yeah, I was about to say, and, and you, I think you actually saw that in the Joint Chiefs of Strafts, hostility to Trump. But, yes. um, because, and and that's that's an interesting problem. And, and like, because I'm like, that gives me some hope, but not a lot, because we still have to deal with climate change. Um, right. I mean, I don't see a scenario where lots of people aren't going to die. To get back to my horrible cynicism, I think billions of people are going to die. I, I, I think that's just probably true. I think that there are some, I mean, this is kind of where I am near Rash and Abbasalus. I think that, I don't think that we can avert some very bad things. I think very bad things got pretty written in stone in the 70s through 90s and there's Agreed. and aughts and there's no way out of it. I think that what comes next, what comes after that collapse is very much up in the air. And that's kind of the field on which I'm inclined to play with my politics at this point. I don't think there's anything in the next 20 to 30 years to be done. I think there's a ton to be done in the next hundred. Right. Um, We have, and this is why I'm not also putting my money on other states like Russia or China to do it either. 
Um, no, they're all gonna they're all gonna have their own versions of collapse. Uh, Russia is when Putin's cult of personality implodes. Russia is gonna have a real interesting time. No, and it, it, it's having been a country that effectively has already collapsed once in recent memory. Yes. Um, um, and while I, you know, people can talk about China, I think China's the most responsible superpower. Blah 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 blah. Um, still having the it's still having to use a ton of coal. It's yeah. it and its supply lines are what they are. Um, they're very limited. Um, and look at where the equator goes through. Mm -hmm. Like pretty much anything on the equator is going to be borderline uninhabitable, and that includes Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, there's a whole lot of. Uh, I've actually been glad you went this dark because I I've been kind of hinting at this and sometimes saying it with my audience to get them to like snap out of all these like projections onto other places, other people, other ideas, figures like Bernie figures like, like that's not going to help you in the immediate run. Um, and I'm not, I'm not also saying be like an individualist prepper. Cause that's also not, frankly not going to help you no, in the, in the immediate not. run. Yeah. Um, one of the points I have made more than once is that in a in a post collapse world, the society without enough guns is going to last a lot longer than the one without enough sweaters. Yeah, yeah, and both and the one with the most food is going to last longer than anybody. But yeah, um, though so, I mean, food and sweaters go reasonably well together. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. If, if you're good at one, you probably have the other down. Um, what is going to, what, the people who are going to, people, the social structures that are going to survive are social structures. What is going to ha happen are the people who, the places and um, communities that are most inclined to take care of each other and most inclined to be remotely good at practical logistics. Those are Community and logistics are going to be the things that decide whether a part of the world is habitable in a uh, hundred years. Yeah. All right. Well, on that not quite Cheery? as grim note, um, <laughs> uh, we uh, can in here and I guess maybe you guys should read some cyberpunk literature to get some, some pre actually, I, I Another cheery note. Let's both suggest some literature. I'm going to suggest an actual fiction literature here. I'm going to suggest people go back and read uh, Paulo Bagliacuppi um, and Ooh, his um, a stuff on uh, post collapse uh, bio futures because um, he's the water yeah. knife, right? He's a water knife. He's the wind up girl. That uh, yeah. Um, but also writing about how all these technologies after collapse don't necessarily go away because they don't all depend solely on uh, right. on fossil fuels. Some of them depend on on genetic engineering, which is not a cheery future. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's but um, but yeah. And uh, so, what would you suggest for people to read? Oh, let's see. Um... If you haven't read N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy, that's probably the single most important piece of science fiction fantasy of the 21st century so far. Um, if you're absolutely dying for something quite contemporary, uh, I don't know how much like visionary political future it has, but Shelley Parker Chan's She Who Became the Sun is on the Hugo ballot this year and is the only interesting thing on that ballot. Um, and it's doing... It is at least some new perspectives, and I think that there is something to be said for anything that is doesn't feel familiar right now. Um, you know, in a time when everything is fucked, any exit you have is at least an interesting one and worth looking at. She Who Became the Sun is very much uh, different than other things out there right now. So those are my two. All right. Thank you so much. Um, have a great evening. Thank you. You too.